always being ready whenever we call you you always say yes of course we are going to be doing something this year and uh, we, we are very lucky for that I just want to introduce Olga I know that most of us do know her but um, this is just a tiny bit about Olga Liberti as a professional Olga began her English studies at the Asociación Cultural Inglesa in Buenos Aires. Throughout her career as a teacher of English, she taught English and American literature at Juan 23 and to the Escuela Superior de Idiomas, Universidad Nacional del Comahue. She also attended a course on literature at the University of North Florida. She was the head teacher of the Juan 23 English department until her retirement a few years ago. And, uh, well, it's an honor and a pleasure to have her with us today. Thank you. Okay. Hello. How are you? How really are nice you? To, to meet with you again. Uh, I was thinking that the, the title of, uh, we gave to this, uh, this talk is not exactly what I'm going to talk about. I mean, the title corresponds to the second part. I would like to introduce some, uh, some other topic before uh, dealing with uh, James Joyce's uh, a portrait. And the, the, the topic I want to introduce is reading, as inter reading and interpretation, because when we read, the activity is to interpret what we are reading, no? There's nothing else. And it is quite complex because uh, this activity is quite complex because writing is also an inter interpretation, an interpretation of the world. And so what we do is an interpretation of an interpretation. Well, but this is the, the experience that we all have. Um, that is, the first part is about our activity as readers. Of the three novels written by, by Joyce, the novels, I'm referring to the novels, a, a portrait is perhaps the less uh, sophisticated, the less sophisticated in the, or the least sophisticated in the sense that, it, that the reading of, uh, of this novel is quite straightforward. No? It is not difficult. You may come at the end and, and then say, well, finally, what did, he, what did he tell me? But reading is not difficult. Uh, however, there are many lines to follow in the novel. I don't know whether, uh, whether you have read it. Uh, it, does, it doesn't make any difference if you haven't, because I'm not going to refer particularly to the novel, but to other aspects. But if you read it, you will find that there are several lines to follow. Uh, Island and the Irish, as the title say, uh, which says, which combines, of course, uh, Irish history, Irish politics, Irish religion, uh, Irish language, etc., and Irish families. Well, uh, then the, uh, there is, uh, of course, family life is also important. Identity is important. Uh, national identity, not only uh, personal identity. The decision to become an artist. Language. Language is a beautiful uh, line to follow that we are not going to touch upon it, but it is a beautiful line to follow if you decide someday to read the novel. My idea, I think, that I told, uh, that once I told um, um, Sandra, <laughs> uh, my idea is that maybe sometime we may, uh, you can meet again after you have read the novel and follow one of the lines, and then we can uh, see if, uh, how all the lines cohere if they do. No? That would be things. But it is not unusual for a text, especially a literary text, to, to comprise many lines to follow. The problem is when we read, uh, what, uh, we, what we do with those, uh, w with those lines? how we uh, manage to weave all these threads into a smooth fabric. No? This is uh, what uh, Henry James once uh, called the figure in the carpet. That is when all the pieces of the puzzle fall into place and then you have the, you see the whole figure that the writer wanted to paint. Bueno, 
the, um, that's uh, the beginning. It, there is, um, I always uh, think, because uh, well, I always thought, because I have uh, quite a good experience in, in reading and in teaching uh, literature, that one, uh, one very interesting question that Umberto Eco poses is, uh, I will par paraphrase it, uh, it's not ex his ex exact words, but how can a literary piece postulate several possible interpretations on the part of its reader, but at the same time regulate them. That is, uh, uh, to shorten the question, how is it that not all interpretations are legitimate? And it is the text, the one that will allow or not. The, uh, to, um, to answer, we have to take into account the several uh, operations that we do when we read. Uh, suppose that I give you a very simple sentence, no? a, a short sentence, or you hear somebody say, saying this, or you read it. As soon as he entered, he sat at a table and he ordered a coffee. The first thing we need is uh, the code, that is to share the same, uh, the same language. The second is the second thing we do, the second operation. We are not aware eh, of this. <laughs> they are almost unconscious. But the second operation is to remove ambiguities. For instance, in this very simple sentence, who is he? The only thing we know is that it is a male character, but no more than that. We expect that there will be more text that will tell us or that will help us to remove the ambiguity. Then uh, we need a certain knowledge of the world to make uh, sense of this sentence. For instance, uh, where did, uh, what, what place did he enter? It must be something like a coffee shop or a coffee parlor where there are several tables because he chose one uh, uh, a table, that's what he, the sentence says, and where there is somebody who he can order to bring him a cup of coffee. So, but this is what we, it is not in the text. Nothing of this is in the text. All this is what we, uh, what we readers bring into the reading. And this is what we call encyclopedia. That is, we need a dictionary to understand the words, to, to know the rules, the grammatical rules that govern, govern the sentence and also as, as some sort of encyclopedic uh, knowledge of the, of the world. Now, without an address, see, that, that is, the addresser is the, the one who writes or speaks or sends the message. Without the addressee to, who receives the message to make sense of the, of the sentence, the, the text does not exist. It's the same with, the, with the novels. If you read the novel, it is a novel. If you, have, uh, if you simply have a look at it, it is a book and nothing else. Huh? So our activity as, as, as readers, as addressees, is very important. Uh, when uh, the consequence is, or the consequences we can uh, uh, mention is that all texts are incomplete, hmm? that they are full of, uh, of holes, of things that are not said in the text, and that the text, then the text is a very lazy mechanism that needs somebody to push it so as to find meaning in it. In, um, now, when a, when a text is uh, a complex, this happens with all texts, no? Uh, but when the text is a very complex literary text, as uh, this one or as many, many others, what happens? Because only these uh, operations of understanding or knowing the code, uh, removing ambiguities, is not enough. That's why uh, they are right in the middle of the booklet that so kindly Patricia prepared for all of you and for all of us. You have a sort of diagram that it is not mine, but I adapted it. It is a, 
uh, really this uh, echoes, but Echo was not only a, a novelist, but also a magician, mainly a magician. So he makes things more difficult than they are, <laughs> at least in my opinion. So uh, the addressor needs or has private codes that is, uh, uh, and maybe we may call them uh, social dialects, no? Uh, his own uh, codes for, to express himself. He has an ideological makeup. The ideological makeup means all the convictions, the be beliefs that he may have. And of course, that the addressee also has these uh, characteristics. The, um, the writer or the addressor has an encyclopedia, and he suppose if he is. Uh, conscious of what he's doing, no? not, not always they are. That this encyclopedia is shared by the, uh, by the addressee. What happens? That the addressee has a certain real knowledge of the world and that may coincide or not with the uh, expectations of the writer. And then there are concrete circumstances that aim at producing meaning, that is, this is the aim of the writer, he wants to produce meaning, and the, the addressee finds himself also in concrete circumstances that may enable the meaning or obscure the meaning. And these circumstances, we all know of them because we are here, we are inscribed here. Age, social class, gender, education, experience, imagination, empathy, so many things that are needed to complete the to complete the text with a certain with a certain meaning. Um, so, what kind? We, is that clear? I hope it is. No, yes. because the diagram itself is uh, is uh, clear. Uh, we may ask the same question, no? or rather, our uh, experience as, as readers. Uh, tells us, or, or, yes, uh, enables us to say that, yes, this is what I need. I need sensibility, I need imagination, I need, uh, I need a certain knowledge of the world, I need uh, to empathize with the topic or to empathize with the characters, etc., etc. And nowhere, in no text, does the author, the author tell us, you should understand this text this way. Nothing of that, no? I was thinking of a, a person who is not very experienced in writing, in reading, reading for the first time, or coming across for the first time, The Sound and the Fury, with only one episode seen from different perspective. Well, he may uh, conclude, well, the writer didn't have uh, much imagination, no? He, he wrote only about one episode. Well. <laughs> there is no coincidence there between the knowledge of the world of one and the other. Okay. Our, uh, the activity of the author uh, is that the activity of the addressor, no? that he has to encode the, the text. And he must try, however unconsciously he does it, but he must try that all the possible interpretations reinforce one another, not exclude one another. If one interpretation excludes others, something is wrong with one interpretation or with the other interpretation. And the decoding, decoding the text, is the activity of the, of the reader. No? And it will depend on his linguistic, uh, linguistic abilities, his, his capacity to associate his his capacity to discover references. This is so important when reading, when reading literary texts, because there are other texts that have one target. Suppose a text, a medical, uh, a medical doctor who writes a text for medical doctors. For certain, they will share the code, they will be able to remove ambiguities, etc., etc., and the text will have one meaning. The problem is what kind of, uh, of uh, model reader, you know, somebody who can uh, interpret the text, is the one that is necessary to make sense of literary text, especially com uh, this complex literary text. Uh, now, 
there's one thing uh, so far it did, I have uh, spoken about interpretation there's another topic which is uh, linked to this which is semiosis and semiosis is the possibility um, that anybody can uh, use to continue uh, uh, creating signs to produce meaning it may sound some, somewhat difficult but it is this suppose that you come to the end of the book and you are not happy with the, with the end of the book not because it doesn't have a happy ending because those who are, who are used to reading literature know that happy endings are not very common in, uh, in literature but you are, not, you are not satisfied with the end and then, and then you say yes but however if that of if she I will give you an example, and which is quite uh, personal. Uh, I suppose that many of you have read The Portrait of a Lady. Mm -hmm. yes. I don't know if you were satisfied with the end, when Isabel Archer renounces happiness mm -hmm. huh? and remains with her husband and her stepdaughter. I was not satisfied with, <laughs> with the end. That was my reading. But what is true is that it's the only possible end according to the character that Henry James depicts. There's no other possibility. And also, I will call your attention to the title of the, of the novel, which is different from the one we are, we are dealing with, which is The Portrait of a Lady. No, A Portrait of a Lady. Mm -hmm. The Portrait. So in, the, in uh, Henry James's eyes, I suppose, at least in the text. I don't know what he thought about women. But in his text, there's no other possibility, of, there's no possibility of any other meaning. If she is a true lady, then this is the only way in which she can act. Now, of course that we can go on, yes, but, yes, but if, if she had, however, but this is the music. The text has closed. This is the end of the, of the text. Not only the end, but the conflict is solved. She, she renounces uh, happiness. Now, this is, a, the, uh, as I said, this is semiosis. No, we continue inventing, it, which is not exactly a sequel, because a sequel takes the characters where the previous uh, text has left them and continues with the adventures. This is another text that we are inventing because we are not satisfied with the end of this. Uh, now, I don't know if there are uh, now, if there exist novels like the True Romances, that, that, that those magazines uh, typical of American, uh, of American experience, no, of American culture. Uh, true romances. Uh, I remember my grandmother reading the, the stories that appear in Parati. Oh, yes. I suppose that there are no more uh, magazines like uh, this, but she read uh, Parati and Mariville. Bueno, another, uh, another uh, famous, I, I have never read her books, but another famous author was Corinne Tejado. Bueno, these books are open, we may open these books, that is, we may violate these books. They close. The depiction of society and of women in society is a patriarchal description. Yes. It's a patriarchal text and nothing else. So the picture of women there, if there are any conflicts, she will be submissive, she will, she will suffer anything, she will renounce anything, uh, she will be, uh, I don't know, the, the, the soul and heart of the family, uh, a true mother, a true housewife, etc., etc., etc. The books, these books, read in this way, close. They solve the conflicts. Now, what do we do, especially we women reading women's literature nowadays? We open them. We violate them. 
we read into them, and this is, this is what has to do with the last uh, atomic, no? the concrete circumstances, no? uh, age, social class, rent, gender, etc. We open them and we give them a different meaning. The, the texts are not open in themselves. I don't know if I'm, uh, I'm making myself clear. They are not open themselves. They are closed texts. We open them because we add to this, uh, to this uh, kind of popular novels or uh, novels of the 19th century, texts written by women, we read them in a different way because we have a different perspective. So we open them and we read them according to a certain uh, social dimension that the text does not have. This is the difference between interpretation and semiosis. Oh, it's a rather opening text. Uh, if, you were, uh, if you were present at my talk on Toni Morrison, you may remember that I said that all texts, uh, all Toni Morrison's texts, as well as many others or African-American writers, do not close. They simply come to an end because they do not solve any conflict. And I, uh, perhaps you remember that I told you, the uh, literature cannot uh, solve the conflicts that society does not solve. So the writers cannot do any other thing but the, write the last uh, period to, the, to their writing. Because in this case, uh, we are not violating the text, there is no semiosis, we do not continue the text, because the sociological dimension is in the text, no? which is uh, different. Bueno, just one uh, final uh, reminder as regards this uh, first, uh, this opening, let's say. Uh, modern readers and modern authors are not persons, but linguistic or semiotic constructions. Why? Because they are two different strategies in the text. We, human beings, are flesh and blood human beings, and we are not linguistic signs. So neither the author nor the reader is inside the text. We are outside. We are here in this diagram. These are all pragmatic conditions. Why pragmatic? Because they are outside the text. They are not linguistic. They are not in the text. The texts are made up of linguistic signs. And we are not. Hmm? Well, no, that's, a, that's a reminder because this is, it is very important. It is uh, the basis of discourse analysis, let's say, you know? Uh, and it is important to remember because usually, uh, when I don't want to, to, to continue with it, but I will add something very short. We usually say, uh, suppose, uh, Joyce says, no, the text says. We don't know what, what, if Joyce said the same things as uh, Stephen. What we know is that it is Stephen the one who says, or the text the one who says. Huh? Joyce is outside his text. He's the author only. <laughs> no, no more, no less than the author. All right. And now we will use this, um, the portrait of a lady uh, to see if we can uh, understand how this activity of reading uh, functions. That is, what, a, what kind of model reader did uh, Joyce have in mind? We will never know. We are not either inside uh, uh, Joyce's mind to, to see his, uh, to know of his expectations. But what we uh, can do is to see the strategies that we find in the text hmm, to make sense of the text, if we are able to do so. As I said, as I, uh, as I said before, no, before I said, uh, I would like to say this. The usual reading of uh, a portrait is that it is a Bildungsromance. The, the, the word is uh, German, but it's the, the word used in uh, literary analysis. It is the, a novel of growing up, a novel of maturation. That's uh, the meaning. And indeed it is. Huh? If you, uh, has anybody read it? No. Well, ah, you have. Well, 
So we know that it takes uh, uh, Stephen, when he's a very young child, until his youth, he's about 20, 20 or 20 odds, when he decides to flee, let's say, from Ireland. Uh, so indeed, it is a novel of growing up. With some addition that it is not only growing up as a human being, not only personal growing up, but also artistic growing up. This is, uh, that's why I said that perhaps language, is, language in it, not perhaps, is a wonderful line to follow because you can follow the different steps in uh, Stephen's uh, experience when he's a child, when he's an adolescent, when he, when he starts primary school, when he becomes an adolescent, the changes in his language. See, uh, I mean, uh, bueno, I will not discover anything if I say that Joyce, among all other things that he is, is a, is a master of language, a master really of language. Bueno, uh, so indeed it is a novel of growing up, but uh, a novel that follows many lines. This growth of, uh, of uh, Stephen, which is both personal and artistic, as I said, is accompanied by other lines in the text, the ones I mentioned before. Uh, uh, la family life, Ireland, Irish history, religion, uh, language, art, literature, tradition, well, and many, many others. All the lines he deploys, of course, are relevant. And you will see this when you read the, when you read the text, if you read the text, rather. Uh, but, of course, I had to make, a, to make my own choice. So I, cho I have chosen two lines. One is myth, and the other is identity, both personal and national. And uh, the first one, myth, it, we, uh, it appears uh, in the very name of the protagonist, Stephen, Stephen Didales. To begin with, Stephen was the first Christian martyr. Uh, it comes from the Greek word Stephanos, which means crown, and by extension, honor, things like that. Uh, he was the first Christian martyr. He was uh, killed or stoned to death just one year after Christ's death. That's why he is the first Christian martyr. And it is very interesting to, to learn that uh, among the multitude that stoned him to death was Saul of Tarsus, that is Saint Paul. The <laughs> someone who later <laughs> will become Saint Paul. Bueno, I don't know if your sympathies are with him. <laughs> All right, uh, and he was accused of uh, blasphemy. Bueno, but what really calls our attention and makes us think immediately of mythology is his last name, which is Didalus. Didalus, written in the text D-E, and uh, in the myth it is D-A-E, no? But it is the same, uh, the same person. We, this is, uh, Joyce will, uh, has used this uh, mythical name for the first time and then he will use Ulysses for his uh, second novels. And I think that it is not arbitrary because the Irish claim their descent from Greeks since very, very early time. They come from Greece, from, the, from Greece, yes. And I think that they have reasons to think of that. Remember that it, it, it is not the first time I mentioned them, but Celts, Celt tribes or Celtic tribes, is spread from the Black Sea to the East and then all over Europe. Uh, the, uh, well, no, Asia Minor, of course, the whole of Greece, uh, Italy, uh, Switzerland, Austria, the south and west of Germany, uh, finally, they reach uh, of the whole of Gaul, that is France, and finally they reach Spain. So, and they were settlers. Of course, they were invaders, but they, uh, in those times, nobody, uh, uh, no tribe, tribe uh, got, uh, moved to a certain new territory and asked me, "I stay." No, 
they uh, stayed by force. But they were settlers. This is it's whole families that moved to the new territories. This, uh, bueno, uh, the, I don't know whether it is real history or it is legend that it says that the uh, Celts saw from the from Spain uh, the Emerald Isle, no, the the Green uh, Isle, and so they moved there. Uh, they moved uh, with the, no under the the command of the the sons of a um, uh, Celtic hero, Milesius, whose name appears in Ulysses twice, twice if I'm not uh, mistaken. Okay, then uh, we his strange name uh, here. Yes, I will refer to this. His strange name. And this is uh, something that he says. And let's see if it is. Yes, the first uh, the first quotation here in the booklet. He, uh, now as never before, his strange name seemed to him a prophecy. Now for him, for for uh, Stephen himself, the name is a strange. Now. You know who Didelus was, no? Mm -hmm. Didelus is a mythological figure who comprises many other because he appears in many in many myths. The most important is that of the labyrinth, the uh, Minotaur, and uh, the, yes, uh, King uh, King Minos, Queen Pacify. Who was this Didelus? Um, he was. Uh, he, oh no, he belonged to the royal house of Athens. And he had to flee from Athens. The mythographers are not, do not agree on the reasons why he had to leave uh, Athens. But anyway, he fled to, uh, uh, to Crete, that is the, the kingdom of King Minos. He, he was a magnificent smith. He was an artist, really. The best artist in those times. That's what the myths say. Because he had been instructed by uh, the goddess Athena herself. So imagine having such a master. Uh, bueno, he made all sorts of things, beautiful things, according to what the myth tell. And uh, when he arrived in, in Crete, he was heartily welcomed by King uh, Minos, and he be began constructing and making things for them. Uh, for instance, mobile dolls for, uh, for the children. And so all of them, all the family loved him. The problem uh, arose when uh, Queen Pacify fell in love with the, with the white bull, etc., etc. You know this. Uh, indeed, it was a punishment of the gods because uh, King Minos had not sacrificed the bull to the, to the gods. No? And so the gods punished him by making his uh, wife fall in, love, fell in love with, the, his, uh, with the, the, the bull. So she asked uh, Didelo's help, and, uh, because she wanted to have, of course, sexual intercourse with the, with the beautiful bull. And so he made a sort of mechanic cow for her to, to get into it, etc., etc. The, he did this, Pacify had his moment of happiness with the, with the white bull, but there were consequences, which was the, the, the famous monster, the Minotaur, no? half a human being, half, a, half bull. When, uh, of course, the King Minus was uh, angered when he learned of, this, uh, of his wife's affair, and especially of Didalus' help in the affair. He did a scandal in the affair. And so he uh, ordered uh, Didalus to build a place where they could hide the monster. And he built the famous labyrinth. No? And uh, when it was finished, they, they uh, put there the, the monster, let's say. But King Minus ordered Didalus to to get into the uh, into the labyrinth together with his son Icarus, and so they were imprisoned there. 
we were thinking also of choice. Nobody could imprison uh, Didelus. Didelus was a magnificent artist, and he was a genius. Hmm? Uh, so, this is what Stephen wants uh, to do later. He could escape all kinds of nets, hmm? of all kinds of fetters. And he made those famous wings, remember, that he, he made a frame and then spaced it the, 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 the feathers with wax. And so he uh, gave uh, a pair of wings to his son uh, with, the, mm, with the advice not to fly very near the sun. But the, but Icarus fell into the Aegean Sea. Uh, but uh, Didalus continued flying west until he reached Sicily, the a famous, uh, um, the first set, Greek settlement in Sicily, which is Cume, or Cumae, which is very well known because it was, uh, uh, there was a, a temple for Apollo and a fam famous uh, oracle. Uh, I don't know if some of you have read The Wasteland, the epigraph of the wasteland is devoted to the, the civil of Kumai, no? Bueno, he reached there and he was uh, very welcomed by everybody, no? And he finally, he stayed, uh, stayed there. Now, why, uh, why did Joyce, this, is, this would be more or less the, the story, so it's a wonderful story, no? It's a way of explaining the, the way Crete uh, began to lose uh, power and uh, Greece to acquire power. Finally, the, the Grecian would uh, conquer uh, Crete. No? It's, uh, I, I like to, to remind you of this because uh, many people reject uh, myths as superstitions. Myths are explanations. Hmm? Now we give uh, historic or scientific explanations. They, uh, instead, they didn't have a history like the one we are used to reading nowadays, uh, but they explain this loss of power on the part of uh, Greek, uh, of Crete, uh, by means of this, uh, of this, uh, big, but, but, but I will stop there, <laughs> because it, otherwise I will continue speaking of the, of the myth. Uh, now, why did Joyce choose his name for both the protagonist of a portrait and then, because it is the same as Stephen, the protagonist of Ulysses? Uh, Ulysses is, by the way, derived from the Sicilian Greek dialect. No? Ulysses, uh, Odysseus had many pronunciations, different pronunciations according to the different di Greek dialects. And, uh, in Sicily, he became Ulysses, and in the Romans uh, took Ulysses and transformed it into Ulysses. And Ulysses then is the, the title instead of Odysseus. Bueno, what connections can we find then between Stephen and Didalus? Well, now you have some here, no? This one, the first one here. Uh, now, as never before, his strange name seemed to him a prophecy. So timeless seemed the gray warm air, so fluid and impersonal his own mood that all ages were as one to him. A moment before, the ghost of the ancient kingdom of the days had looked forth through the vesture of the haze wrapped city. Uh, this is a reference to the Vikings' invasion of Ireland, because the Vi Vikings are the ones who founded Dublin, hmm? and he is in, he, in Dublin, uh, he refers to Dublin. Bueno. And then uh, it says, he seemed to hear the noise of dim waves and to see a winged form flying above the waves and slowly climbing the air. What did it mean? Was it a quaint device opening a page of some medieval book of prophecies and symbols? That would be Celtic, no? A hawk-like man flying somewhere above the sea. A prophecy of the end he had been born to serve, etc., etc. The whole passage is beautiful. You can read it at home okay, slowly and carefully to, uh, to like it all, all the more. Then, um, 
Bueno, the, the following passage also is the, his, his heart trembled, his breath came faster, and a wild spirit passed over his limbs, etc. Uh, an ecstasy of flight made radiant his eyes, and wild his breath, and tremulous and wild and radiant his windswept limbs. Here it seems uh, that uh, he is um, identifying with Icarus mm, rather than. Mm, Later, of course, he well, of course he doesn't commit suicide. That's it. <laughs> That's the idea. And uh, bueno, and then this other one, the colonnade above him made him think vaguely of an ancient temple, and the ash plant on which he leaned wearily of the curved stick of an ogre. A sense of fear of the unknown moved in the heart of his weariness a fear of symbols and portents, of the hawk-like man whose name he bore soaring out of his captivity on ocean-woven woven wings, of Thoth, the god of writers, writing with a reed upon a tablet and bearing on his narrow ivy's head the cast bone. Bueno, uh, uh, Joyce is terrible. There are so many references in just one, uh, one paragraph that I want to refer to the myth, but I have to say something else, because it's not only the myth of, uh, of uh, Daedalus that it appears here, but uh, Thoth, or Thoth, is, was the Egyptian god of writers. Mm? That's another, a reference to a different kind of mythology. Writing with a reed upon a tablet, and bearing on his narrow ivy head the gasped moon. Uh, I will not refer to the Celtic aspects of mythology in, uh, in the portrait. It is not so, so strong as this reference to Greek mythology, but it is also important. The moon, the moon goddess, uh, was identified with a cow. And it was uh, the same for, uh, in all mythologies, including Greek and Celtic and whatever. And, um, uh, the cusped uh, moon are the horns. That's why the, the goddess of the moon is identified, or rather the cow is a metaphor for the goddess of the moon because of the horns. Mm. Uh, the moon goddess is, was a, go a goddess of fertility. And of course, uh, the cow is a nurturing animal. So that's why it it was used as a metaphor. Bueno, you see that all the things that are in only just a few, a few lines. It's wonderful to work <laughs> on them with a certain, with a bit of help. Bueno, and uh, by the way, Thoth, or Thoth, is uh, the Egyptian god of writing, and his counterpart in Greek uh, mythology is Hermes, the god Hermes. A ver, let me see if there's uh, anything else that um, now we are doing fine. Um, also, bueno, and of course uh, there's uh, another reference, um, the following. It, it refers also to Irish history, to Irish uh, a culture here, but a, mm, I've never seen. No, no, it is not here. I forgot. Bueno, the last one then. Uh, the last one is the last entry in the diary, and it is the last uh, topic in uh, the last uh, uh, page in the in the novel. The uh, the f entry says uh, of April twenty sixth says. Mother is putting my new second-hand clothes in order. She prays now, she says, that I may learn in my own life and away from home and friends what the heart is and what it feels. Amen. So be it. Welcome, O oh life. I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. This is his aim. And the last entry says, Old father, old artificer, stand me now and ever 
in good stead. Uh, he, um, he does not fly near the, near, so near the sun that her, his uh, wings are melted, but he is Icarus, really, you know, addressing the, his uh, father, who would be Didalus. He, he bears the same, uh, the same last name. Uh, and uh, here, in, this, uh, in the entry, in the previous entry, not the last one, I see um, a connection between mythology and the idea of a novel of growing up. Because when he says, I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. Indeed, it, uh, it seems a, a certain saucy defiance of a very young person who is certain that he will achieve uh, great deeds that nobody had achieved before. He is going to create in the smithy of his soul the uncreated conscience of my race. I think that it is too much for a young person who was only 20 years old and who had not, re who had not written anything yet. No? This is, I'm referring to Stephen. Uh, so you see, and when we spoke of the lines or the threads in a text that had to, uh, to weave a fabric, bueno, this, here there is, a, there is an example, no? the, line, the mythological line connected with the idea of the novel of the Bildungsromance or the novel of growing up. Bueno. Uh, there are uh, also lines uh, uh, that refer to uh, Celtic mytho mythology. They are not so strong, but if uh, I would like to finish first with identity. If uh, you are not tired, then we may refer to these other lines uh, uh, later. Now, uh, growing up and the search for identity and also a search for identity as a writer or as an artist is Stephen's, uh, Stephen's pursuit. Uh, and his pursuit includes his final decision to become a writer because he finally leaves Ireland behind because he doesn't want to, uh, he wants to get free. And he thinks that he has to go away from from Ireland if he wants to be a free artist, to write freely with no tradition, no traditional past. But that was his uh, expectations. Now, the problem is, the problem for, for uh, Stephen and also for us, for all of us, is that we are born into a certain soil and that we have roots in that soil. In that soil no? And the soil is the country, the nation, including the, the family. Those are our roots. We may uh, reject them, but they will, somehow they will be always there. We are born here, not any place else. Whether as a Stephen or whether as James Joyce, he will discover, I'm certain, that uh, Though he had to leave his land behind and his tradition behind so as to become a free, a writer who felt free, he still, he, he will always, or he always remained in Ireland. That's the Irish writer that he was, no? He's, uh, well, no, we'll see, we'll see this. Now, to understand the, the, the country that he leaves, we, we have to ask one, a question, what kind of country does he live? Bueno, eh, just a few historical facts. If uh, you were, uh, those who were present at my, at my talk on the development of the English language may remember that I told you that the Anglo-Saxons were greatly influenced and educated by this, the Gaelic culture that flourished in Ireland, especially during the, the, seven, the seven and the eight hundreds, 
and uh, they created monasteries that were uh, really, f in those times, they were really universities. So they educated the Anglo-Saxons, they gave the Anglo-Saxons a, a, a culture, or they helped them to have a culture. They gave them an alphabet, because they, uh, and the Anglo-Saxons didn't write. The, the, the Anglo-Saxon was not written until the Irish taught them to write, gave them an alphabet. And of course, and also recovered uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, chronicles and Anglo-Saxon poems, uh, old poems, because they wrote them down. Uh, of course, there is also another, so there is a, a relationship between Anglo-Saxons and, uh, I'm not referring to the Normans, eh, but the Anglo-Saxons, uh, and also the Vikings, because the Vikings invaded, uh, invaded uh, Ireland, as I said, they founded Dublin, they finally they were defeated, but the, there had been intermarriages and uh, they had shared culture, especially in poetry. That's quite, uh, quite inter interesting. The sagas and, um, and storytelling and minstrelsy that are so typical of Gaelic culture are also typical, of, for instance, of Ic Iceland, no? uh, of Viking culture, especially the one of the, of the north rather than Norway or Sweden. Bueno. Uh, so th there is this, or there was this beginning of a relationship when the Irish, Irish culture, um, uh, the culture in the monasteries was really Irish, and I think so far as I know a bit of history, at that moment, especially when uh, with the uh, coming to an end of the Roman Empire, there was no other place in in. Uh, in Europe with a culture like this, like the one developed during those two centuries by the Gaelics, by the monks, no? the Gaelic monks. Uh, in the 12th century, the um, uh, Norman, Anglo-Norman, we could, could, can call them now, uh, started having uh, acquiring lands in Ireland. And of course, some years later, Henry II got the Pope to uh, proclaim him a feudal lord of Ireland because he feared that his vassals would have too much power. Remember that we are uh, at the beginning of the of medieval times of feudalism, and for feudal lords to have power was to have lands. That was the equation. No, uh, no other. And so they began, in the uh, Anglo-Normans began to acquire lands uh, there. But it was too much for the uh, Anglo-Normans who, who, who ruled uh, England. They said that our people there are more Irish than the Irish. No? And so they feared that. What happened? Two centuries later, I, I think it was in the 14th century, they, there come the statutes of Kilkenny. And I suppose that those who studied history may know of them. Uh, and the statues of Kilkenny were the first step in destroying, totally destroying Gaelic culture. She says yes. So I am right. <laughs> so I'm right. All right. Bueno, the, uh, and, and these uh, laws of these statues forbade uh, intermarriage. Adoption, the use of Irish names and dress, uh, Irish sports and pastimes, uh, Irish way, even Irish way of mounting horses, that is without saddle, that was forbidden. Uh, English common law replaced the Brechon laws, which were written and we were very intelligent. Uh, there was, of course, they established the separation of the churches. Irish minstrels and storytellers were forbidden in uh, English areas. And on top of all, these, of all these restrictions, the Gaelic language was forbidden. English was imposed hmm? under pain of losing lands and possessions. And this is the beginning of the estrangement between the two ethnic groups. Uh, 
that is, uh, as I said, this is the first step in the destruction, the suppression, rather than destruction, of the Gaelic culture. Then, bueno, there come uh, other, uh, other movements, no? Uh, uh, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, Henry VIII, the one that was proclaimed uh, King uh, of England, then the plantation of England, uh, that is uh, the plantation of Ireland, that is the colonization of Ireland began under Elizabeth. Uh, well, and there are, of course, the Irish did not remain uh, quiet. There were many in, insurrections until Cram Cromwell came and suppressed all sorts of ins insurrections. There was, uh, the, by the act of settlement, he deprived all his opponents of uh, lands and uh, possessions. And some, for some historians, what uh, Cromwell performed there was a real genocide. Mm -hmm. The destruction, n not only of the culture, but of the people who were born into that culture. And then came the penal laws, again, the Catholics uh, that were deprived of, of uh, education, voting, and the military, no? they were forbidden. And, uh, and then, after this, this is the beginning of the 18th century, there came two centuries of permanent insurrections, uh, some period of peace, insurrection, the crushing of the insurrection, and then uh, um, sort of an a, a period of peace to a certain extent and another insurrection, but a, a, either by death or by immigration, Ireland lost millions of, uh, of uh, people. No? If it, and there was a certain period, I don't remember exactly when, but it became really depopulated. Hmm? Uh, many of, uh, of the one of the Emigrants from uh, Ireland came, for instance, after the French Revolution, uh, went to France. Mm -hmm. And they engaged in the Republican armies. And uh, they continue doing so. They, uh, they are known in history because they call themselves the wild geese. Mm -hmm. there, uh, there is a reference in the portrait, not to the wild geese, but to the tame geese, that is, the Irish now under uh, British uh, colonization. And, uh, and they uh, engaged, in, or they uh, uh, entered any army that fought the English. Their enemy were the English, and by extension, any imperial power. And we have examples here. No? El Almirante Brown, Bernardo Higgins, uh, San Martin's field assistant, uh, John O'Brien, the people came there to help whoever it was that needed help to fight against any imperial power. They started with the English, they continued with all other powers. Sorry? In the Civil War. Yes. Yes. All right. Bueno, so to sum it up, Ireland was a colony for seven centuries hmm? until the beginning of the 20th century. Her original culture, politics, institutions, customs, and above all, language were suppressed and went into exile or oblivion. This is the island that in which uh, Joyce uh, lives. Uh, not, not only Joyce, of course, no. <laughs> many other, uh, other Irish. Now, We can imagine, but no, we don't know exactly how he felt in, in that situation. No? He must have not been very uh, helpful to his idea of uh, having freedom to create. Um, he, was, uh, he was more than well read in all European literature. When he left Ireland, I mean, no? he, was, uh, he was young. And he loved European uh, literature. He, he was diffident as regards uh, as to how the the Europeans will uh, if rather how and if the Europeans would understand the plight of an Irish writer, because it, indeed it was a plight, a very difficult situation. If your former uh, culture has been absolutely uh, destroyed, 
he was disdainful of the poor remnants of that old uh, Gaelic culture. But at the same time, he was terrified at the idea of losing these poor remnants, because it would mean that the, the Gaelic culture had totally disappeared. The country that gave rise, or the, that was the home of the Gaelic culture, would disappear if these poor remnants disappeared. Uh, he, he was also very well read in English literature, and he loved English literature. He admired it, but he didn't love the English or England, M none of the two. Uh, and he, I, I, I think that in these circumstances, his uh, situation was, uh, as an Irish writer, was to try to make Europeans understand the situation of an Irish writer, what it meant to be an Irish writer in those circumstances. And this, uh, I uh, can't avoid thinking uh, of if there are many people, including myself, who can understand what it really means to be deprived of language, of a language, and to be imposed another language. It is not only to be deprived of a language, to be because uh, human beings are language. We are inscribed in language. Without language, we are not human beings. Uh, and the only, of course, I, I'm not very much read in uh, these uh, topics, but I, I immediately remember when I was reading about the suppression, the way they suppressed the uh, Gaelic language, I thought immediately of the Mapuche experience how they lost their language. And then I remember that several years ago, I read a novel by a, by a Mapuche woman, who is a writer, Moria Mijan. The title is El Tren del Olvido. And precisely, she speaks one of the, it's a very interesting novel. And uh, she speaks of, uh, she makes uh, a comparison between the English uh, colonization of Patagonia and the English colonization of Ireland. That's a very, that's very interesting, no? I, but uh, it, it's very difficult to imagine. We have not, well, we, our ancestors might have been deprived of their language, but by now we are not deprived of our language. But imagine that we come across, I don't know, uh, uh, because I know that the, of the existence of languages in which the verbal system that we use does not exist. And so, for instance, there is no past. Why there is no past? Because their ancestors still live with them. They are living with their life. Now, this is the philosophy or the metaphysics that is inscribed in the language. That's why they don't have a past tense. Imagine that for, uh, to forbid them to speak that language without a past tense as to force them to speak a language with a past tense. You have to change all your view of the world. No? The, the, the philosophy, philosophy, yes, we all live in a philosophy, no? The philosophy that is the basis of, of uh, your life. That's why it is so interesting to read about this suppression of the Catholic culture and think of, uh, of uh, uh, writers like uh, Joyce who found themselves in those circumstances. Uh, he said that who he would, the, the only certainty that he has is that he had to leave uh, his country and the only thing that would help him are the qualities of Didalus, no? Silence, exiles, and cunning. We don't know if this was enough for him. Now, are you tired? <laughs> not yet, not yet. Um, then, there are passages, and I will refer only to two or three, in which uh, um, uh, Stephen refers to this suppression of their, of their culture. Remember, though he is disdainful of the remnants, but not of the old uh, culture. Um, indeed, the remnants of this uh, culture stayed in the, uh, in the west of Ireland, no? in Cork and his uh, father's family came from Cork, precisely. Bueno, eh, 
the, the, I think that one of the main uh, references is that, that to language, to the suppression of the language. And here, I think we have, see, it begins here uh, with, uh, with quotation number seven. He is with the, the dean of the studies in the Jesuit uh, college that he, he attended. And um, if they, uh, the dean is trying to, uh, to build a fire. And he says, that, said Stephen, is that called a funnel? Is it not a tandish? What is a tandish? That, the, the funnel. Is that called a tandish in Ireland? Asked the dean. I never heard the word in my life. And then, this is an episode, and then, had, uh, comes the the way he reminds what the the, the dean has uh, told him, and he says, the language in which we are speaking is his before it is mine. Mm -hmm. How different are the words home, Christ, ale, master, on his lips and on mine. I cannot speak or write these words without unrest of spirit. His language, so familiar and so foreign, will always be for me an acquired speech. I have not made or accepted his words. My voice holds them at bay. My soul frets in the shadow of his language. Mm -hmm. I think that the passage is uh, so telling. It's uh, amazing the way he, the way he can express uh, his line. Bueno, uh, and then... Um, Bueno, now this is, and there's one more in which uh, he, uh, he speaks of his uh, of the Irish race as a race, and it is an ethnic group, we <laughs> don't use the word race anymore, but he did. And uh, the last one says, this, this race and this country and this life produce me. He said, I shall express myself as I am. Try to be one of us, repeated Davin. Davin is a young, uh, is a um, uh, student, uh, his friend, and he is a young uh, Irish nationalist. In heart, you are an Irishman, but your pride is too powerful. My ancestors threw off their language and took another, Stephen said. They allowed a handful of foreigners to subject them. Do you fancy I am going to pay in my own life and person debts they made? What for? Well, this is really is, um, we read it, but I imagine the anguish of the person who feels that way, no? Eh, bueno. Eh, let me see uh, something else, not, not of the quotations. Uh, I want to, uh, to refer also to uh, something I came across, no? Massini, Massini the, the Italian hero, the one who fought, the activist and politician who fought for the unity of, uh, of uh, Italy, once asked, I don't know whether he asked uh, the Irish this question, but he could have asked them. He said, what distinctive civilization justifies your separatist claim? I remember that this is already the 19th and early 20th century. And indeed, when uh, we think of Joyce's answers to that question, they are not in the past. They are not in the Irish past. They are in the future. That's why I say that there is a, bef at least in literature, there is a before Joyce and an after Joyce, because he opened ways for post-colonial writers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if he, uh, if he could create in the smithy of his soul the uncreated conscience of his race, but he, indeed he opened, uh, he opened a path. And it's very interesting, uh, it, uh, a path for future generations of post-colonial writers. Uh, there is a first wave of colonial writers, and now there is another wave of colonial writers who had to deal with this problem of uh, old cultures and the new culture, the culture that the, the old language and the language that had been imposed. 
this is what we read. We, we read African. Uh, I promise to make a list of both uh, colonial uh, writers, recent writers. No. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Let's have a workshop. <laughs> no. No, no. Bueno, for you to read and not for me to discuss. Um, the, but the one who interpreted this is one of these post-colonial writers, who is the famous Solomon Rushdie. And he says once that Joyce created a form that allowed the miraculous and the ordinary coexist on the same level aspects of the same order. And what's that? Magic realism. Nothing else but magic realism. The magic realism that we know also. That not only our uh, Latin American writers use, but many other post-colonial writers use this precisely. Um, Garcia Marquez and, bueno, and so many, so many others. And then, after all, all post-colonial writers and uh, peoples and whoever that had been under some imperial command for years, especially uh, an empire that destroyed their culture, and I'm not only referring to, to England, of course, no? there were many other empires. Uh, all these writers and all these peoples come from the same experience. And so it's no wonder that uh, Joyce opened the path for uh, writers of very different uh, cultures and very different nationalities like Solomon Rushdie and Garcia Marquez, the ones uh, that I, I mentioned. And here I would like to add something uh, that for the, for the colonialists, all of us, all uh, subjugated peoples, all colonized people, are or were Taliban's. That is, we were the ugly ones, mm -hmm. the bad people. We were that. And uh, if, if you remember that it is in the Tempest precisely, and there is a passage in which Caliban mm -hmm. tells Prosper or speaks especially about language, and he says, he, he tells Prospero, you taught me a language, and my profit on it is I know how to curse. The red play read you for learning me your language. It is quite in the, well, this is something I found out while uh, preparing this, uh, this talk. I knew that the, the figure of Caliban had been used by many uh, Latin American essayists no? of the 60s and 70s. Indeed, there is a cool collection of, uh, uh, I think that the title is Caliban Revisited or something like that. It, it was written, several essays written by a, a Cuban uh, poet and linguist. Uh, he was a friend of, uh, of uh, oh, the one who is in the MIT, the famous uh, li linguist. Johnson. Yes. Johnson. All right. He was a friend. Of that. Bueno, and uh, he wrote this uh, this series of essays using the metaphor of uh, of uh, Caliban for a representation of ourselves, uh, Latin American. But when, uh, as I said, when I was preparing this. I found out, to my surprise, that the figure of Caliban had been used in the same way to represent the Irish experience in regard to the colonial experience of the, of the, of the English, coming from the English. And uh, one of the main uh, uh, writers, let's say, or the most known uh, writers who used this uh, metaphor was uh, Yeats, the poet. William Butler Yeats and all, um, some of his followers, that is all the uh, English, uh, Irish uh, uh, revivalists and the, Angli the Irish nationalists. Bueno, so you see that, uh, um, that is, if you are interested, that's another line to pursue, the idea of Caliban. 
And uh, to finish this, I, I remembered uh, an essay written by Borges, and the title is The um, Argentine Writer and Tradition. It is in the book Labyrinth, no? if, if you want to read it in, uh, in English. And so I reframe the advice that Borges gave to uh, American, uh, to, sorry, Argentine, Argentine uh, writers as if he were speaking to, uh, to Joyce. Of course, Joyce never heard of it. And he said, he told Joyce, hmm, or I tell Joyce, Joyce through the language of, uh, through the words of uh, Borges, you should not be alarmed. You should feel that your patrimony is the universe. You cannot limit yourself to Irish subjects in order to be Irish, for either being Irish is an inescapable act of faith, or being Irish is a mere affectation, a mask. As I said, I don't know whether uh, Joyce heard, I suppose that he didn't hear of this uh, piece uh, of advice, but he wrote as if he had, no? Mm -hmm. Finally, he wrote about topics that are centered in Ireland, and speaking of the Irish experience, he is speaking to the whole universe, at least to the universe of us, <laughs> post-colonials, no? Bueno, and that will be that. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your for your patience. Uh, I uh, I couldn't make it shorter because uh, the two topics uh, and and even uh, there are uh, aspects of, uh, for, for instance, of mythology that I didn't want to touch upon because it would make it very long. Perhaps when you read the novel, we can refer to <laughs> to. Celtic mythology as appears in this book. Indeed, it, it, is, uh, it, it was an idea that I invented uh, with, uh, with Sandra, no? Yeah. To read the book first, and then you tell me, bueno, f four or five persons have read the novel, and we have followed different lines, we would like to discuss them. Why not, no? But you see how the, the threats uh, really, at the end, it is so evident, for instance, when one, uh, one thread of the, of the so many that, uh, that uh, Joyce deploys here in the text, that they come together no? at the end, in the middle of the book. One that is beautiful to follow is language. Language is fantastic. See, he was so careful in the, in the construction of his sentences. I, I remember the... Uh, while uh, reading uh, uh, Joyce uh, and uh, what he says about language. No? Uh, I remember uh, Cortázar in one interview that he speaks of the, the way that sentences have, uh, should have not only a balance but a cadence. And a period at the end of the sentence must be a period. Nothing else can be added to a sentence that is well constructed. Bueno, in that sense, uh, Joyce was, uh, was really a master. Hmm? Uh, there, there is an, well, um, no, I will not continue <laughs> speaking because I will never finish otherwise. <laughs> All right, I think that, that that's enough. Okay. Thank you very much. You are very good. And I like to see your faces. <laughs>